Uh, I want to uh, thank all our participants uh, who are Zooming in tonight virtually, uh, all of us coming together and within this new normal. And I also want to thank RPS for hosting us via Zoom tonight. Thank you all so much for the, the technical help. Uh, I want to begin by um, acknowledging something that we all know collectively, and that is these are certainly some challenging times, not just for us individually, but also uh, uh, for our families as well. I know there's a lot of anxiety out there. There's a lot of fear out there about what's next. Uh, since March, uh, our families have been uh, dealt, a, I would say, a serious blow, whether it's economically by their jobs or also with the fact that schools have closed and have adapted to this new normal. And uh, I think all of us uh, uh, in this uh, in public service recognize that our families are going through a lot. And we, can, we are trying our best to do everything we can to ensure that we meet them where they are. And so I am grateful for the work of RPS, particularly around ensuring that our kids continue to have meals, even through this, uh, this health crisis. You know, uh, parents and caregivers are struggling with in this incredible dilemma. And they're worried about how they go about protecting their kids from this disease that we are still learning more about each and every day. And are also the, they're worried about how they're able to continue to put food on the table and ensure there's a roof over their children's heads as well as a family. And as we approach uh, September, I know that school and public education remains on the minds of a number of our parents. And uh, I, I wanna uh, commend all those who are working at RPS who ever since this pandemic has struck, the city of Richmond have come to work every day to ensure that we still provide a high quality public education um, to uh, our families and particularly to our, our children as well. Um, I also wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize um, uh, some of the resources, uh, the transparent information and the resources that have been available for uh, the virtual reopening by Richmond Public Schools as well. Uh, I know there's upcoming community walks to share the reopen love for, with love uh, information with families. I should say hashtag reopen with love. Uh, also, I know that RPS has gone uh, has, has updated their website and their schedules and they're prior prioritizing the health and safety of all of our children too. And also for all our parents who are, who are watching tonight, remember if you are facing or, or if you are looking for help or you want to help another parent and a family out, please use uh, our website, rvastrong.org for resources that are located there. That is our community hub uh, for um, those who want to help and those who want to give help as well. So real quick, I want to uh, just go through our agenda for the night. And if we can flash that on the screen. Okay, just looking at our agenda tonight, we are uh, currently I'm giving my update, uh, but my update will also feature an update for, on the mills tax. Uh, also from our joint construction team and the the construction of new schools here in the city of Richmond. Uh, also, we'll talk about the RPS budget. Uh, we'll provide, pro well, the superintendent will provide an RPS budget update. We'll also talk about the re RPS virtual reopening plan, and we'll have a discussion on the child from the child care task force as well. And then we'll close things out and talk about next steps. So, uh, as we transition to the next point of our agenda. Uh, an update from my office, which will be the Mills tax update um, before uh, John Wax speaks and Bob Stone speaks and will speak as well. Um, I, I think um, I want to just first say that um, there are, uh, I have an opportunity to visit most of the schools here uh, that are under construction that will be opening here pretty soon um, and they are beautiful facilities of facilities that I think uh, show our kids that we love them and uh, I think whether it's the investment we've made in um, the maintenance of our schools the upkeep of our schools or just building new schools that's what this is all about showing our children that they love them and that would have been made possible without uh, paying just a little bit extra on our meals here in the city of Richmond and so I want John Wack the Director of Finance for the City of Richmond to provide an update on where we are in the collection of those taxes. John? Good evening, everyone. Um, just have one slide here, but I can provide some additional context as others may need. 
Uh, but as of the end of June, the one and a half percent meals tax levy had collected had rendered about $7.2 million in revenue for fiscal year 20. That's a bit less than uh, the prior year uh, of about $8.5 million, and it represents about 11 months worth of revenue. Uh, for example, the, the meals taxes that we receive in the month of July will be accrued back to June uh, fiscal year 20 because they are associated with taxable sales in, in, in June. So we do anticipate collecting about uh, $7.6 million, which would be a million dollars more than the modified budget. Um, but anyone with uh, short-term concerns just wanted to, to point out that even with th those reduced collections, we're going to have a cumulative cash balance of about $15.7 million at the close of fiscal year uh, 2020, which we will uh, reserve and, and assign uh, when we put together our financial statements. Uh, for those that may not be familiar with how, how we borrowed for the schools, we did uh, go out and, and borrow $90 million uh, before the construction period because the market rates were so good. We were able to get, get those uh, general obligation bonds at 2.2% interest, which was much less than the, the spending uh, plan, the multi-year spending plan had, had, had presumed. And we are, um, so for example, if we end up spending $149 million, we would need to borrow another 50 nine million dollars but because we haven't really uh, borrowed that second tranche yet and um, we've only been paying interest dur during these earlier months in the first couple of years we do have uh, a positive balance of about 15.7 million dollars i'd be glad to take any questions on that are, are there any questions for uh director whack Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have one. Sure. Is that, uh, is that Dr. Listen, Jones? It, 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 it is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Oh. Um, and, and let me say this even up front. I, I just want to commend uh, everyone on the school board, uh, Mr. Cameras. Y'all have handled this with dignity and grace and professionalism. What you've done and are doing is no simple task by no stretch of imagination. So my hat's off to you. My heart goes out. Uh, to everything that you're doing now. Mr. Wack, can you tell us what we're doing? Were, were there projections? Did, did we project where we might be? Uh, and can you speak to that, uh, how we're performing two, pro, uh, two projections? Certainly. Uh, so when we put together the, the spending plan for the $150 million program for the three, three new schools, uh, we presumed we would get about $9.1 million a year from the 1.5% uh, tax levy. We also assumed uh, we would borrow, the borrowing cost could be as much as 5% interest. Uh, so when we did, uh, we did do a press release back in uh, October of 2019 when, when we borrowed that first $90 million. Uh, in, in getting that, getting that $90 million at only 2.2% interest, we were able to avoid over $40 million over the, the life of the bonds uh, in, in interest costs. Uh, so that, that, that has really uh, help, helped the, the spending plan. Um, we haven't paid all the bills yet as, as we're finishing construction on the schools, but if we were to borrow another $59 million uh, this fall, uh, I certainly would expect us to get uh, good, good interest rates with our strong, strong uh, credit worthiness. Uh, so uh, I, I think we're, we're, we're in good shape long-term as long as the uh, restaurant industry or really the, um, the prepared food sales uh, bounce back to, to, to relative nor normal levels pre-pandemic. Thank you, sir. Any further questions for Director Wack? Mr. Mayor? Yes, hey, Councilwoman Lynch. Hey, um, also I'd be remiss um, not to mention that President Newbill is on with us. She's just having some technical difficulties and cannot get her volume um, to work. But she is with us in spirit and somewhere virtually out, out in TV. <laughs> um, but in any case, this is, I guess, a question for Mr. Wack. So um, this is fantastic news, right? We have uh, a $15 million positive cash balance. Does that go, does that additional uh, monies go just to paying down the, the bonds or can that be reallocated elsewhere? So we've uh, always associated specifically with the, the new school facilities. Um, so 
uh, we would have multiple options, I suppose, if we did not want to borrow the full, if for example, it's going to be $149 million, we wouldn't necessarily have to borrow the full $59 million. We could use some of our cash balance to borrow less, um, or we could maintain the, the, the cash balance year to year to make sure that the, um, the, the prepared food tax revenues are, are going to be sufficient uh, so we can, we can meet, meet the long-term uh, growth, growth and, and, and pay those debt service expense, expenses over the next 20 plus years. Any further questions for uh, Director Wack? So, <clears throat> I have a question. Is this Ms. Doerr? Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, so, uh, so it, there's the cash balance, but then there's additional debt capacity that we could draw down. Actually, um, is that? Can you just help us break down? I, I know some of the payments are reoccurring to service the debt, and then some uh, enable us to draw down more debt. So, I guess what I'm trying to ask is: Is there more money to build another school? I wouldn't say there's a significant amount of additional debt capacity. Uh, the city has has multiple uh, debt policies, and the most restraining is uh, that only 10% of all, um, all general fund revenues can uh, can be used towards debt service. So if we, for example, um, borrowed $10 million less, that might free up $10 million in, in, in capacity o o over time. But um, I get, j just to be conservative, we, we, we are um, accumulating that balance and, and I'm looking forward to seeing how, how the um, prepared food tax collections uh, recover. Uh, when I looked at uh, what, what the city collected in July associated with June sales, we were at about 60% of where we were in the prior year. So um, it, 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 and you can obviously see a, lo a lot of our restaurants are still closed. So we uh, want to see how, how long it might take for us to um, to get back to the, the pre pandemic pre pandemic or um, or something along those lines. Gotcha. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. Didn't know this was such an exciting slide. <laughs> Anything else? Well, before we move on from an update, and thank you, Mr. Wack. Uh, from the joint construction team, I wanted to make sure that those out there in the public uh, know that who is on the call today representing, member, representing the school board and also the city council. Uh, I see that we have uh, Chairwoman Owen, uh, Vice Chair Burke, uh, Member Page, Member Gibson, Member Young, Member Cosby, and Member Dorr from the Richmond School Board. Did I miss anyone? From the city council tonight, we have joining us uh, Councilman Jones, Councilwoman Lynch, Council President Newbill. If I missed anyone? I'm here as well. Hey, Councilwoman Larson, good to see you. Good to see you too. And Councilwoman Larson. All right. We will move on to a report from the joint construction team. Mr. Stone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of city council, members of the school board, uh, superintendent cameras. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the same uh, schedule slide we've, we've had uh, since pretty much the outset of the project. And I'm, I'm happy to say we're We've stayed on schedule despite the, the pandemic. Uh, we're in the final stages here of uh, delivering and installing uh, furniture and fixtures. Uh, right now, the architect is, is in the process on all three schools of doing his uh, punch list inspections of the schools. Uh, building commissioner has started his uh, final inspections on the schools. So we're ready and on schedule to have them uh, available for occupancy, even though they're not going to be occupied right away uh, here at the, the end of the month. Next slide. So this is a 
budget slide showing, I guess, our firm costs to date. Uh, it's not too much different than, than what you've seen the last couple of compact meetings. Uh, point out the bottom, we're still on track, I think, for overall final cost for all three schools to be in the 146 and a half million range. You'll see, I guess, the, the firm cost is about 147, but up in that construction line, there are contingency and allowance items in there that we don't expect to use all of. So that will should finish up lower. And that's kind of how we get back down into this 146 and a half range. Next slide. And just now I've got, uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to go out and tour the schools uh, recently, I got some recent photographs. Uh, this is a drone photo of showing the front of the, the new River City Middle School. Uh, this is the opposite side showing the three uh, academic wings, the eighth grade wing, seventh grade wing, and sixth grade wing uh, going left to right. This is from uh, last week. They're out down uh, placing sod and, and doing landscaping work at the middle school. This is the, the main uh, gymnasium. Uh, still have bleacher seating to install over on the, the left-hand side wall, but otherwise it's pretty much ready to go. Next slide. Uh, this is the second floor of one of the academic wings. Uh, it's a nice, you can see nice, open, bright, airy space. Uh, got classrooms along the, the right-hand side there. This is a balcony looking down into uh, an open sort of project-based learning area down on the first floor. Next slide. This is one of our typical classrooms with uh, the desks and chairs, furniture set up. Uh, been offloading furniture for a couple of weeks now at all three schools, still continues. Next. Uh, this is the library media center room. Uh, just started offloading the furniture there. It's pretty much ready to go. Uh, moving on to Cardinal Elementary. Uh, this is kind of a view looking from the back of the school out towards uh, the front street. Uh, see, we're in the process of, of paving the, the front parking lot. It used to be a bunch of classroom trailers sitting there that we couldn't get rid of uh, till sort of the end of the school year here. But uh, those are gone and that, that's underway. Uh, uh, next slide. This is the, the front entryway of the school with the new name sign up. Next. Uh, this is going in the front door, kind of in the, the front entrance lobby area and the, the front admin wing over to the left. Next. Uh, it's a view down the, the main corridor. Next. Uh, this is a typical classroom. Next. Uh, this is the, I guess, gym cafetorium, uh, kind of standing in the, the, on the gym side, looking towards, in towards the, into the cafeteria and looking at the, the stage area. Next. Uh, this kind of looking the other way from the cafeteria, looking out towards the gym. Uh, there is a, there's a, what's called a skyfold door that comes down where that, I guess, blue portion is uh, up on the ceiling there that would normally be in a down position separating the, the two spaces, the gym from the cafeteria. Uh, that, I think, is expected to be in either late this week or next week. That was one of the impacts we've had from the, the COVID shutdown. That the uh, door is manufactured up in, uh, I think, uh, Ontario, Canada, and was delayed when the 
Canadian government kind of pretty much shut down their production factories up there. So, but we still do expect to have it uh, received and installed before the end of the month here. Next. Uh, typical uh, bathroom for the elementary schools. Next. Uh, this is the kitchen uh, food prep area. Next. Uh, this, moving on to Henry L. Marsh. It's a drone photo from July 28th. Uh, the front of the school is this M Street down at the bottom uh, right hand side. So we've got the kind of parent drop off loop out front. We've got the, the bus loop uh, over on the, the water tank side of the property. And they're working to install the teacher parking lot uh, in the back area of the school right now. Next. This is just the, the end of one of the, the classroom wings. With it, I guess inside the, the curtain wall glass, there's a, a stairwell. Next. Uh, this is work from last week uh, in the area out in front of the library media center. These are, I guess, what the architect calls learning stairs. It's kind of an open kind of area where they can do presentations or, you know, have speakers or whatever that uh, students can sit on these learning stairs and, and participate in kind of a you know, group uh, session out in this area. Next. Uh, again, the, the typical classroom. Uh, this is up on the second floor uh, wings where you got uh, the third, fourth, and fifth grade up on the second floor. This is uh, kind of a little bit hard to see because we've got furniture boxes stacked up there, but this is uh, an, another one of the collaborative project-based learning areas uh, in this school design. No, oh, that's it. Any questions? Any questions for uh, Mr. Stone? Mr. Mayor, if I may? Yes, I, Mr. Cameras. I just want to say thank you to, uh, to you, to council, uh, to Bob and the whole team, uh, folks on our end, uh, Bobby Hathaway and, and so many others uh, who have been working on this for a couple of years. Uh, the schools are truly beautiful. And uh, as you said, Mayor, when the kids walk in soon, uh, they will know how much uh, we the adults love them. And I just can't wait to see uh, the smiles on their faces and on our teachers' faces as well uh, when they open up. So uh, we're just filled with enormous gratitude uh, to everyone who played a hand in this. It's really, uh, this is a special moment for us at RPS, but I think for the whole city. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Cameron. And I will, I will add to your remarks and just say that I had an opportunity to visit um, River City Middle. And um, I gotta say is when the, I'm not going to very, very new, very much, very new buildings in the past year, um, but it's one of the best buildings I've walked into in a very, very, very long time. Um, it is something that will, will, will shock the psyche, I think, because uh, of the feel. Uh, I mean, it is an academic facility. Um, it feels like something you would see on um, your modern college campus, I think. And so that's the sort of facility I think we want our kids to be in, the environment we want them to be in. And um, when um, you walk through those doors, that's what speaks to you. I can't wait to visit uh, Henry L. Marsh and also visit uh, Cardinal sometime soon. Um, I'm looking forward to visiting Henry L. Marsh, which with you know Mayor Marsh uh, in the near future and and, and uh, Miss Burke, I hope to join you there as well. Mayor, Miss Page, yes, because I cannot find the, um that I would like to speak, so it's somewhere on my screen. But anyway, <laughs> I just would like to say thank you, Council school board and everyone that had a part in in making all of this happen 
Um, this is truly monumental. For me, this is my seventh school since serving on the school board. And I'm just true. My heart is so warm. And to see, I can't wait till our kids walk into the building and see the smiles on their face. Um, but again, because I visited River City, I was just <laughs> blown away. Yep, yep. I, I was truly, truly blown away. But I, again, I just want to say thank you because the collaboration, none of this would be possible if we hadn't been able to collaborate and work together to accomplish and achieve something for the children and the families of Virginia. Yeah, so again, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Page. Well, I'll add to that, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Yes, Ms. Burke. This has been a dream come true. This has been a dream, and I get so full every time I pass, which is every other day, Henry L. Marsh III Elementary School. <laughs> So excited. Thank you so very much because we are delivering on our promises. We, we have delivered on our promises and we will continue. So I thank you so much to you, city council, school board, people in the communities. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Can't wait, can't wait. Mayor Stoney. Yes, Ms. Larson. I have a question. Please. Okay. Um, For Mr. Stone? I, um, I'm not sure who can answer it, but um, I apologize. I got on late. I couldn't find the login information, so uh, okay. this was already discussed or not, but um, what sort of accommodations and planning for the future are we making based on um, the situation we're in now, the pandemic, and if we are going to have to change the way we um, have our children in the physical school space and have bigger classrooms and as well as um, sanitation stations and all the things that we're seeing in workplaces and schools now. Yeah, um, I know we got Bob Stidell on the on the line. We got Mr. Stone as well. Um, I think we talked a little bit about this on one of my visits, recognizing the new state of things. Uh, uh, I think uh, some accommodations have been made and uh, maybe the, uh, the technical team that can speak to that. I'll, I'll take a crack at it. I know we've had discussions with, with uh, RPS's uh, facilities team on, I guess what we see is some of the, I guess, best practices throughout the, the I guess, HVAC industry and, and other schools in regard to combating COVID-19. Uh, I guess, I mean, first of all, I guess the, the schools have, you know, good state-of-the-art uh, HVAC systems uh, with pretty you know, significant fresh air uh, volumes. Uh, I guess one of the recommended things is, is simply to, I guess, kind of a little bit retune the HVAC system to increase the, the fresh air volume. You sacrifice a little bit of energy efficiency in doing so, but, but to get, you know, better air turn air exchanges in the building. Uh, I guess another one is making sure we're using MERV 13 uh, filters in the, the air handler systems. Uh, I think we've talked to RPS about uh, the potential for in classrooms, and this could be applied to even the older schools, uh, you know, put one or two uh, kind of room size HEPA filter units in the portable HEPA filters in the classrooms to, to help clean the air. And finally, I guess we're, we're looking at some relatively, I guess, newer technologies that could be retrofit into HVAC systems to, you know, I guess, kill viruses. Uh, some of them are, are, are UV light systems that could go in the air handlers or ducts. 
There's another technology called, I think it's uh, needle point bipolar ionization. Essentially it emits little ions that uh, go out into the, the space and, and help neutralize uh, viruses and so forth. So that's kind of what we've been looking at and doing, so. Okay, thank you for that. And um, I guess as a follow-up, this, and this is more of a question for the school system. Um, so if we're, if at some point we're considering opening in 2021 in the physical schools, is there somebody working behind the scenes right now to um, gather information on the items that Bob Stone listed out and sort of figuring out what each school's need would be, um, what that would look like, how much time it would take to put those modifications in the schools. Is there some sort of um, post-COVID um, facilities plan, if you will? Mr. Camers, do you want to tackle that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> as you can all imagine, our energies are focused on reopening uh, just under a month uh, from now. Uh, once we are up and running, we will, of course, shift our attention to thinking about and preparing for February 8th, which is our tentative return date. Uh, we have already had some initial conversations uh, with Mr. Stone during JCT about some of the costs of the items he referenced, uh, but that work would begin in earnest uh, right after our opening. Um, I think a lot of our ability to deliver on some of those uh, room-based filters and such is really going to rest on the extent to which uh, Congress uh, finds a way to pass the next stimulus package. Uh, there is significant funding for K-12 uh, in both the Republican and Democratic bills. And, um, you know, we are anxiously awaiting the outcome of that, not just for those uh, physical items, but for others to support our work once we come back in person. Um, but again, shorthand is we're focused on reopening school and then we will quickly pivot towards uh, what does it look like to come back in person uh, come February? Ms. Larson, any further questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Uh, any further questions for Mr. Stone? Uh, thank you, Mr. Stone, for your hard work on this. Uh, I know there's still a few more weeks left before full completion, and I know you'll be working 185% uh, harder than you have been already uh, to make sure we reach that completion date. And so I want to thank you for, uh, for your work. Yes, uh, you I guess it's, it's really been a team effort between you know, city administration, RPS, and the contractors and the dozens of subcontractors and, and literally hundreds of workers. I mean, just uh, you know, a month or so ago, we probably had 200 workers a day at the middle school and, and well over 100 at each of the elementaries, you know, each and every day, you know, pretty much working six to seven days a week, so. No, I could be wrong about this, Mr. Stone, but it, was it roughly, it, it took a year, basically from the foundation time to, what was the timeline? You know, it was a pretty quick turnaround and we wanted to because we saw this was an emergency for a lot of kids who are living in these conditions or on a day-to-day -day basis. What was the total time when we get to date? Get to yeah, pretty date? much, I guess, uh, just maybe about 13 or so months ago, we were just really starting wow. to, to go vertical on the middle school here. You know, and in the case of uh, Henry L. Marsh, uh, we were really just kind of scratching dirt a year ago, so. Wow. Wow. Been pretty remarkable. Yeah. Great work. Great work. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, now we'll move on to uh, Superintendent Cameron. So we'll have a, an update on the Richmond Public Schools budget. Mr. Cameron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to be 
brief, let me give you an, an overview of our uh, federal CARES Act funding. I will try to share my screen. Um, oh, I can't do that while Maggie is sharing. So. <laughs> Maggie, you want to unshare and then? All right, thank you, go. Maggie. Let me try to uh, let me try to take care of this. Okay, so uh, this is a brief summary of our CARES Act funding. We received about twelve and a half million, um, all told. Richmond uh, schools received a little over thirteen million, but a portion of that went to private schools in the area. Uh, we used those funds, as you can see, for. Uh, a number of items, about one and a half million for cleaning. Uh, that work is nearly complete, but uh, still ongoing. Uh, about 800,000 for our health and safety preparations, including uh, temperature scanners for all of our buildings, cleaning equipment and so on. Even though we won't be using a lot of that equipment for our virtual opening, we still need it for our in-person opening uh, come February. Uh, in addition, we had some uh, personnel costs to uh, cover what is in essence overtime for our uh, meal distribution staff during our spring closure. Uh, other supplies, library books, and other things that we gave out during the spring that we want to replenish. We also are investing a significant amount of money in social and emotional learning supports. Uh, by expanding our partnerships with organizations like Child Savers, uh, SCAN, CIS, uh, and others uh, that we already have strong partnerships with. But we want to make sure that our kids have all the supports that they need when they come back. Uh, we know this has been a very difficult time, and uh, academics is, of course, extremely important in our first priority, but uh, social and emotional learning and support is a very, very close second. We also... Uh, in preparation for a physical reopening, um, have hired additional nurses, which I'm delighted to report, uh, and I know this has been a priority school board for some time, uh, means that we will now have a full-time licensed nurse for every single RPS school, which is a, hey. a great achievement. And then of course, um, a significant amount of money for technology, uh, Chromebooks, um, hotspots, and this is for students and staff, uh, as we have shared previously, <clears throat> over the course of the spring and the summer, we distributed about 16,000 Chromebooks to RPS students, about 6,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. Our goal, though, is to get a Chromebook into the hands of every single RPS student, uh, even if they have another device of their own at home. The reason for that is it makes things a lot easier in terms of our ability to push out software updates, uh, make sure they have the latest applications that they will be using during uh, the virtual semester. It also means our training can be uh, much more streamlined since all kids will be using the same interface. And it means that all of our devices uh, that kids will be using will have security software, which is very important uh, when you're spending a significant amount of time online. I do want to note that uh, despite the fact that we submitted these orders some time ago, supply chains are very tight um, and it is likely that we won't have all of these Chromebooks in until actually mid-September, uh, but we have prioritized making sure any family that does not have any device gets those first and then we will move on to other families that have an alternative device in their households. Uh, we did need some additional funding and so uh, we've done some reallocations within um, our budget uh, about $2.5 million uh, that we've done some reallocation. Uh, that's largely for uh, student and teacher virtual teaching and learning kits. So for kids, we are providing a lot of the resources that they would normally have access to in a classroom, but we're gonna provide it to them in a kit for home. So that's everything from uh, basic school supplies, but also things like a student sized uh, whiteboard, which is really helpful in the virtual environment because kids can write answers and hold them up and the teacher can see them all at the same time, things of that nature. Uh, also on the teacher side, uh, we are purchasing uh, a number of items to assist them with their virtual instruction. For example, uh, we are getting teachers uh, what's called a document camera, which basically means uh, they can 
uh, write or draw or do math problems or show a book or do a demonstration. Um, and uh, it is then available on the screen, uh, which makes it much, much easier for teachers to do a lot of instruction. Um, any of you who have tried to ever uh, uh, sort of demonstrate uh, something by drawing with your cursor knows how difficult that can be. So um, a document camera allows you to just write with a pencil and it shows up on the screen. So things of that nature. Uh, again, these are in short supply, given that all of America is trying to do some of the things that we are trying to do. Uh, we're going to do everything we can humanly possibly do to get them by the start of school, but there may be delays and it might be a couple of weeks uh, thereafter. In addition, we're purchasing a lot of technology, I'm sorry, software, in addition to the technology that will help teachers do their jobs uh, more effectively. Things uh, like applications that allow teachers to easily uh, manage classroom discussions virtually, create charts and graphs uh, virtually, um, all kinds of other things uh, to assist with the virtual instruction. Um, and then uh, some technology for adult staff. Uh, we want to make sure, for example, our um, uh, instructional assistants um, have computers so that they can help in their uh, normal way with classes. A lot of them don't have internet access, so uh, we're looking at getting Wi-Fi hotspots for them as well. Um, so all told there, that's about two and a half million. I will say that we are going to have, I'm going to stop sharing now. We will have additional costs, I am certain, um, over the next uh, several months, uh, particularly as we plan for in-person instruction. Uh, and so um, at, the, uh, at the danger of, of um, uh, reiterating, I'll just say the, the federal action is desperately needed. Um, you know, the first CARES Act had $30 billion for schools. Uh, the two versions of the next relief package going around Congress uh, on the GOP side, there's about $100 billion for schools. And on the Democratic side, there's about $300 billion for schools. So we're talking somewhere between three and 10 times what the initial stimulus package was. And so uh, getting some resolution on that is not just important um, for the uh, relief payments that so many out of work uh, Americans need, which is of course extremely important, but uh, also being um, hampered in the uh, delays is the funding for K-12. So uh, we are doing everything we can to advocate on that level. I as a superintendent, uh, as part of the Council of Great City Schools, which represents all of the major urban school systems in America. Um, we are collaborating to advocate as well. Um, anything that anybody on this call can do uh, to assist on that effort would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Cameras. Uh, Mr. Cameras, I had a, a question and we'll take further questions as well. Uh, the question I had had to deal with uh, I was just out in the community and uh, someone asked this question and it sounds simple. Um, and they wanted to know how attendance would be handled virtually. Will, will attendance be still taken? Uh, you know, and, and the, the guidelines around who showed, how many days missed, things of that nature, will they still apply in this sort of virtual world? And um, I didn't have the answer for that. I didn't want to speak for RPS. So I uh, thought maybe you could, if the person is watching today, you can sure. pro provide some, some answers. Sure. Look at a high level. Uh, what I can see is that attendance is still required. Uh, so our expectation is that all kids would uh, show up for their virtual classes uh, when they are scheduled. Um, at the same time, we understand that there are all sorts of new reasons, very legitimate reasons, why kids might have difficulty doing so, um, from the most mundane being your computer stopped working or your internet went out or something of that nature. Uh, and so the state has provided us with a great deal of flexibility to uh, account for that. So in those cases, for example, uh, a student who uh, turned in their work for the day, but were unable otherwise to log on, of course, we would count them um, as present. So we're working through all the specific 
details and how that will all work. But the headline is uh, attendance, yes, will be taken. Uh, we still expect kids to show up. This is a real school. It may be remote, but it is school. Um, and um, there will be grades and there will be report cards and there will be transcripts. Um, it is our obligation and our honor to, to educate. And so that is what we will do. Uh, the rigor will remain the same. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Cameras. Any questions for Mr. Cameras about the RPS budget and the presentation regarding um, uh, the COVID dollars, care dollars? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I could ask a question, I don't know if that's a, that's this a, is the, yeah, you got a puppy in your, your, your um. <laughs> This is better. <laughs> If I'm at home, when I come home, she's going to You look like a type of guy would have a Rottweiler or something like that, but you know. <laughs> in my younger years, my older years, yeah, this is it right here, trust me. So, Councilman, please. Um, how, how can the community at large assist parents that uh, may have kids that, that they're going to stay at home, but child care options? How, how can you... What would you say to community partners, whether it's churches, other nonprofits and things of that nature, how can we assist, whether it be Wi-Fi, whether it be, hey, they can come in and be with us for the day. Are, are we looking at creating the same challenge that, you know, a lot of families averted or were kind of concerned about, uh, you know, being in a classroom in a particular setting? Uh, are we just gonna re are we just gonna duplicate that issue uh, by opening up buildings and things of that nature. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I appreciate the question. As you noted, it's, it's a tricky one, uh, precisely for the, the reason you noted. On the one hand, of course, we want to provide support to working families, to the mom who drives the GRTC bus, who literally cannot do her job virtually, and therefore the kids don't have someone to look after them during that virtual school day. On the other hand, we don't want to recreate the very thing that we wanted to avoid, which was having a whole bunch of kids come back together uh, and potentially um, transmit more of the disease. Uh, so uh, the, the position, in essence, that we have taken is, uh, you know, we are encouraging community partners, churches, uh, other faith organizations, uh, nonprofits, um, who feel that they have the, the capacity, the will, the ability uh, to provide some small scale support in terms of um, you know, oversight for children during the day um, and can do so with uh, all of the necessary precautions that if they are comfortable, if their congregation is comfortable uh, to, to go ahead and do so, we're actually preparing some guidelines around what that might look like um, to be of assistance. We uh, want those organizations to know that kids will receive a breakfast and a lunch every morning from their normal bus stop. So they can go and pick those up. And then if there is a church that um, mom wants you to come report to during the day, you can bring your breakfast and lunch with you. So that will be taken care of. So uh, faith organizations and partners don't have to worry about that. Um, and we'll put out guidance as well as uh, around how to be helpful to kids during the virtual day. Um, so that folks who, who do want to be helpful have a sense of um, what are the best things to do and what are the best things not to do um, during that time period. So we should have that guidance coming out real soon. Um, I've already spoken to a number of, of um, faith organizations around the city who, who are organizing themselves in that manner, and we're, we're extremely grateful to them. I don't know if Ms. Owen or, or Ms. Burke would want to add anything on that front, since I know uh, both of you have have been involved in these conversations as well. And, and uh, Pastor, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, I wanted to also, you know, speak to that because, you know, we worked with the YMCA in the early part of the pandemic um, when we wanted to provide some emergency Girl. child care to uh, our essential workers out there, some of them city workers, some out there who, you know, just uh, had to show up at grocery stores and continue with their, their work. Um, I know Abby uh, Rogers is on the call as well on the Zoom. Abby, you want to just chime in real quick and just? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mayor. Um, 
uh, we are very excited to continue to serve. You know, we've started serving with emergency child care about four days after the governor shut the state down at the request of the mayor called and we were very quickly able to pivot into that. And we served over 500 students during the spring um, while school was closed in the spring and uh, had great success with that with families coming to us. We've learned a lot. Uh, we've been had had a thousand kids in the metro area this summer that we've been able to serve in our summer camps. Um, following all CDC guidelines and the Virginia Department of Health, we work very closely uh, with them and our national organization to understand how to do this as safely as possible. Obviously, there's no 100% safe way of doing this, but what we know, as the mayor mentioned, there are families that are going to have to have their kids go somewhere and we want them to be in as safe a place as possible. And so uh, we've been doing that. We are currently working with Henrico and Chesterfield in order to uh, create the ability to help serve students um, actually in their school buildings, much smaller numbers than what those schools are, not nearly the same as trying to open schools, but bring kids into what we believe is the safest environment if kids are going to be in a congregate care situation um, in schools where you have the infrastructure to be able to separate them, to keep them separated. Every district has to make their own choices about that. And there are lots of different factors that feed into that. Obviously the mayor has been very close to the health equity issues that we've seen here in the city of Richmond um, for many of our students. Uh, and we have to balance all those things with the equity of learning that why is passionate about trying to be able to close those issues. Uh, but we have been able to serve those students without any issues in the COVID um, sickness this summer and in the uh, spring. And so we're just hoping to be able to serve in whatever we can moving forward as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I would say that I, I believe the board will probably need to have a discussion about, about this very issue. Um, and they have not had that dis discussion, much less made any decisions about that. The Absolutely. And that's why I was referencing that every um, jurisdiction has to make their own decisions about what that looks like and how it is best done for that jurisdiction. The, the differences are obviously there. Um, but I, I think what we've learned is that if you do it and you're intentional about it, it can be done safely in much smaller numbers than what our school systems are looking at. There's no way that we can serve. It's a drop in the bucket for what we're going to be able to be doing. But with smaller numbers for those that are really in need and have that essential child care issues, um, I think it's, it, it is the only place we've been able to find where you can scale it to any real level. All of these groups, and we're working with them too, to try to help them understand what we've learned in doing this in childcare when in smaller places where maybe you can do 10 or 15 kids each, but it becomes very expensive and very hard to bring all of the coordinated services together in those much smaller pockets as you go. Right. So again, it just, it, it is a jurisdictional issue. And I know the school system has their own, um, things that they're dealing with. And we wanna be respectful of all of those, uh, but that there are the option that we've been working through as we go as well. Mr. Mayor, I have a question if I may of Abby. Yes, yes, Ms. Burke. Right. Thank you so very much. Abby, thank you so very much for serving in the city of Richmond, 1,000 students, or that was across the metro area? That was the metro area, not just in the city. Um, there were a number in the city of Richmond. I don't have that number off the top of my head, but that 1,000 was for the whole metro area. All right, my question is regarding transportation. Mm. Of the sites where you, um, they were at the Y buildings or they were at different, because the um, reason I'm asking, well, I'm in the East End. Yeah, And there, there isn't, and I'm thinking about many of my children that live in the Fulton area, it's hard to get transportation even to get to the top of the hill. So how were these, how these children that did participate, which was great, I'm sure, how were they selected or were they on a waiting list or, and transportation was or was not um, addressed for them? So we don't, we're not able, again, to provide transportation for all the different spaces. There are one or two sites where we have our uh, Camp Thunderbird out in the um, far Chester field and we do provide transportation from a number of different areas around there to get out to Camp Thunderbird. Um, but they were in our building so that is part of the problem because if we don't have a physical location then we're not able to serve there. Which is another reason why we know we build our schools in order to be able to facilitate where those neighborhoods are and where those children go so it does allow some regionable service. Um, where you have the facilities to, to do it. But these were in our schools and we did, we're not able to offer transportation for all of those students because we don't have the ability to do that either at the Y. 
And I'm going to say, I feel like this discussion is uh, picking up a little momentum, but I also want folks to know that we have made um, this a part of the agenda as well. And so I know that we have one more part of Mr. Cameras' report as well before we can uh, talk a little bit more um, in a more of a comprehensive way about uh, the emergency child care effort uh, that is underway. And uh, uh, if everyone's okay with it, I think what we'll do is we'll stay with the agenda as planned um, and see if now Mr. Cameras, um, if there was any more questions from Mr. Cameras at all. Mr. Mayor? Yes, hey, uh, I, Council Member. I, ha <laughs> I have a question on behalf of, of uh, President Newbill, who is texting me. <laughs> Are you <laughs> <laughs> I, am, I am the, the proxy uh, 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 speaker for. She speaks for, through uh, you. She speaks through <laughs> you. Yes. <laughs> uh, in any case, uh, we wanted to know is uh, RPS, I think uh, Superintendent Cameras, you had mentioned that there was a contract um, for hotspots and for the Chromebooks. Um, are we predicting that we're going to need additional? Um, hot hotspots and Wi-Fi boosters. I know that um, I was doing some research on this. I know Georgia has just implemented a statewide um, contract with a wireless provider. I know other states are kind of moving in that direction. It's my understanding we've kind of left it up to each uh, locality to um, implement contracts with different providers. Um, that was a decision that I guess was, you know, made at, at the governor's office level. Um, and so, you know, where does that leave us in our ability to negotiate and, and ensure that we have enough um, Wi-Fi uh, boosters and hotspots? Um, what I'm hearing and what I've heard from other, um, uh, from families around RPS and um, uh, just from some of our child care provider, or I'm sorry, Parks and Rec, is it might be helpful to have some of those additional um, Wi-Fi hotspots, I'm sorry, Wi-Fi boosters and hotspots um, at some of our um, housing complexes and um, perhaps in our Parks and Rec facilities where outdoor pop-up camps are going to happen. In any case, just kind of wondering about capacity and what the, what the, um, the predicted need is and if we have enough. Well, um, you know, we have ordered additional um, hotspots um, and, you know, are continuing to prioritize those families most in need and frankly, staff who are most in need. Um, you're right that every school division has been managing this on their own. Uh, there has not been, to my knowledge, a statewide deal brokered with any of the major telecommunications companies to provide um, additional relief on this front. I would welcome that. Um, I would welcome it at the federal level, the state level. I'll take whatever I can get. Um, so yes, I do think that would be an area for continued advocacy. That's, that's helpful to know. Um, and uh, perhaps, and this is a recommendation, Mr. Mayor, um, we could revigor revigorate or refresh that conversation um, with the uh, with the governor's office. The state of Georgia just entered into a contract and got um, uh, negotiated uh, quite a better deal um, and used leverage their economies of scale to do so. Um, obviously, doing it piecemeal, we might be spending a little bit more um, per device. And to do that. So that might be something that, that we could work on together as a takeaway. I agree. I agree. Any questions for Mr. Cameras before? And then Mr. Cameras, you may have already touched on a lot of this via the questions, but uh, I know next you want to talk a little about virtual reopening and reopening with love. Sure. Um, let me just point folks uh, to the website, let me just share again so everyone uh, is aware. Um, let me get this set up. Okay. So the best 
source for all the latest information on our reopening plan, which we call reopening or reopen with love, um, is our website. Uh, if you go to the, the homepage, you'll see right up here where it says reopen with love with the heart due to a dedicated section of the website, which has the full uh, virtual plan. You can download that right here. Um, but also on the left hand side, you can see the navigation bar, which takes you to um, everything related to academics, uh, engagement, operations, uh, our social and emotional learning, everything related to staffing and personnel and so on. Everything on this uh, site, uh, this is true for the whole website, but it's important that everyone understands this uh, for the reopening plan can be translated. Um, and here are the instructions in our highest frequency languages. Um, and we have some quick links here. Uh, one of the things we just put out today actually was our family checklist. And so I'm grateful to our engagement office for putting this together. Uh, you can see uh, a set of questions that we're asking every family uh, to look over and there are links, uh, contact numbers, emails, where folks can reach out to get uh, answers to any of these questions or any of these issues that they need to address uh, before September 8th. Uh, so again, this is uh, where you can find everything. We're constantly updating it. Um, and again, our website, rvaschools.net. You can always find it. Uh, it's on the rotator right here, but also it's always right here, Reopen with Love. Just click on the heart and you will be taken to all of the information that you need. I'll just pause there, Mayor, and take any additional questions uh, that folks may have. Any questions for Mr. Cameras regarding reopen with love? All right, seeing none, uh, we will move on to our discussion about um, emergency child care and um, child care in general during these times that RPS is um, tasked with um, opening virtually as well. And uh, before I begin, I wanted to say to Mr. Cameras and his team that I know that um, you guys have worked very, very hard to, I would say, innovate yourselves uh, uh, into a solution uh, during this time, and I believe you all may have been one of the first uh, school divisions in the state to say that we were going to uh, go virtually and whatnot. Um, and I'm um, obviously we saw a, a study recently that was it nearly 90,000 kids in the last couple of weeks of July uh, tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, there are a number of divisions in the Commonwealth who have followed suit as well. And so I want to say thank you all for being the, the forerunners on this uh, topic. And obviously the importance of uh, this discussion we're about to have now about child care and, and the work of the child care task force, I think is, is significant because uh, there will be some parents who will be faced with the challenge of choosing whether or not to go to work and put food on the table and keep a roof over their children's heads. Uh, and uh, whether or not they stay home and ensure their kids get a quality public education from rich and public schools. So uh, earlier this year, during the midst of the pandemic, um, Rich Schultz, who's the executive director of uh, Smart Beginnings RBA, uh, formed an emergency child care task force uh, in response uh, to a request made by Governor Northam uh, in March, which includes many stakeholders uh, such as uh, folks that we're familiar with, uh, organizations like Child Saviors, Child Savers, uh, Virginia Department of uh, <laughs> Education, uh, Virginia Early Childhood Foundation, Peter Paul Development, and my office to just to name a few. There are many, many more organizations out there. The task force helped uh, Richmond establish emergency child care programs early this spring uh, that Abby spoke about earlier, uh, including the center at Carver, uh, and at some of the YMCA's, uh, I did a press conference early on uh, in the when we were uh, early in the pandemic uh, at the the downtown YMCA. Now, once they completed that work, they turned their attention to the 
uh, emergence of COVID-19 related crisis in childcare uh, on the 27th of July. Uh, I pulled together a number of these stakeholders, including many of the folks who are here with us today to again discuss some opinions, uh, some options and opinions on providing this sort of emergency care during the upcoming school year. I asked the task force to support the coordination of a wider discussion, I think that needs to uh, happen uh, in reference to our families with children ages zero through 12 uh, and to mobilize you know, sort of the community response that will support these, the needs of uh, our families. Uh, now that uh, we know that RPS will be open virtually, everybody knows that you know, we're gonna have to answer some of these questions and all schools divisions are making different choices on this front and I know that RPS and collectively with the city of Richmond, we're gonna to have to make a decision as well. Uh, so we have today, we have Rich with us here, uh, along with uh, uh, Elliot Haspel uh, of the Robbins Foundation, Abby Rogers, who's spoken earlier, Barbara Sight with Next Up. Uh, many of these partners are, have partnered with us uh, on our um, advancement of uh, after school programs at each elementary school and middle school in the city, which, in the city of Richmond, which we all should be very, very proud of. Uh, and now they are here today. They've been working um, uh, diligently over the course of the last few weeks uh, on options and ideas that could potentially be of help to us and our families who are, uh, who need us the most. And so I wanted to see if, uh, I wanted to give an opportunity for Rich uh, to, and to also uh, Elliot as well to talk a little bit about the work they've done already and the ideas they're considering and maybe the help they need from not only just us as a city, but also from RPS as well. So uh, I'll turn it over to Rich and Elliot. Mayor Stoney, thank you so much for having us on tonight. And thank you, uh, Superintendent Cameras, members of the school board and the city council. Um, and appreciate the robust conversation you guys have already had about this issue because it is a, it is a critical one, we believe. Um, and as uh, Mayor Stoney had mentioned, we've had a group that's been meeting since March um, on a weekly basis that's been working on emergency child care. And thank you, Mayor Stoney, for bringing us together with the out-of-school time partners. Um, so what we want to do now is um, kind of just give you, a, a, I guess, a situational analysis of our community in child care and make some recommendations um, and just tell you about some next steps. Um, so we can go ahead and dive right in. Um, so um, obviously the big question is how do we ensure there's quality ch child care, facilitated learning sites and after school care, um, and, and that it promotes learning, health and social emotional needs of children zero to 18 and supports our parents and families' abilities to work. Uh, one thing we think it's important and we all know this, but 80% of the brain develops before a child reaches the age three. And those early years starting from birth through age 12 are critical. Um, and a child's development. So um, now more than ever, we need access to, to quality, quality learning experiences for these children. We also know that the disparities for our children begin in the very early years, um, particularly for our children of color and our children in economically disadvantaged situations. Um, so we believe now um, it's more important than ever to prioritize access for our most vulnerable families. Um, also, as we work together to navigate the crisis, we need to prioritize our young, youngest learners birth through 12 and marginalized families who will not have access. Uh, we also know that for our youngest learners, particularly three-year-old and four-year-old children, virtual learning is not a viable option for working families. Um, as Superintendent Cameras has already noted, we have a lot of families who, who rely on childcare to be able to get to work. Um, so we need to be able to mobilize a response. Um, so we can move to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, one thing that we do know is, and we, I know you all, all have seen the news across the country, uh, the child care sector, sector is struggling. Um, and we recently, in partnership with Child Savers and, and many of our other partners that Mayor Stoney mentioned, um, conducted a survey of our child care providers in the region. Um, and this is just some of the, the headlines that we wanted to bring to your attention tonight, um, as this is, this is new information. Um, you know, we know that childcare is a broken business model and the pandemic is only exacerbating the struggles of childcare providers and access to families. Um, this recent survey uh, in our region confirms what we're seeing across the state. Many of our providers remain open and are serving and prioritizing working families. However, 
um, you can see from the survey that 70% of those providers indicate they may have to close permanently in six months without financial assistance. Um, and we've already referenced uh, the federal stimulus funding that is moving through Congress now. And this is also critical for childcare providers. Um, they, they definitely they need financial support. Um, the other thing too that we know is 50% of them report significant issues with staffing. Um, and we also know th this is also true for our out of school time providers. Um, these are, um, a lot of them are, are small organizations that are, are really struggling um, in the current environment. Um, so you can move to the next slide. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about the challenges, another thing that's worth mentioning is on a recent CNN, CNN business article noted that single parents, parents with young children and parents who can't work from home or groups most at risk to stop working entirely. Um, and we need to be thinking about that and its impact on our workforce. Um, so in terms of, of child care providers, not only custodial care for children birth to, through 12, but also child care providers are critical um, to making sure that our children are ready when they reach kindergarten. Um, right now in Richmond, there are 119 child care programs in the city of Richmond, 76 child care centers and 30 family day homes. And these, these programs are serving thousands and thousands of children in our community. Um, just to, from the responses of our survey, the folks who responded, they, they're serving post-COVID about 5,000 children in our region. Pre-COVID, they were serving close to 10,000. And that's, that's just a small representation of the total universe of our providers. Currently, 40 centers are open and 28 family day homes, and all are operating with reduced ratios. Um, the reduced classroom sizes are among the most significant challenges. We know that that is needed for health and safety, of course, but this also makes operating these businesses vulnerable. Um, when you're operating at 50% 50, 50 capacity, um, that really impacts your revenue and your ability to operate a business. Um, in addition, these providers in our community are primarily women, minority-owned businesses, and they are struggling. Um, providers report difficulty in accessing critical supplies and food. This has been referenced earlier. Limits on bulk purchasing and limited access are impacting our operations. Um, liability is a growing concern for providers who are open and considering reopening. Um, next slide, please. Um, now moving on to some of the solutions. Um, while we are in, in very difficult situations for our childcare industry right now, we believe this is the time to start talking about what are workable cost models for providers. Um, a recent Minneapolis Federal Reserve study showed that our child care providers currently, on average, are losing about $18,000 a month for a center and $1,200 for a family day home. Um, we also believe um, we need to make this information about where to find child care readily available to our families. Um, child Care Aware is the state's resource and referral hotline for child care for children birth through 12, so we should be publicizing that um, expansively. Also, um, prioritizing access for low-income families, essential employee, fam essential employee families, and also struggling students. We know these equity gaps begin early and grow rapidly, and children of color and then low-income families are at an immediate disadvantage by this compounded epidemic. Next slide. Um, some other solutions too. Um, help our providers in identifying supply chains for bulk purchasing and PPE. Uh, cleaning supplies, food, and equipment continue to be in high demand. Um, also, incent child care, out of school time, and government and school partnerships. Uh, last week, uh, BDOE released guidance um, on schools and child care partnerships, so we should pay close attention to that guidance as we move forward. Um, also, Mayor Stoney, you referenced these, but these are um, just a, a, some of the organizations that are serving on this task force and are already working on solutions. So, um, I knew I couldn't name all of them. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and I hate to, to, to paint a, a pessimistic, pessimistic picture, but I think it's important for everyone to know um, what these providers are facing, um, because, again, they are in very difficult conditions. They are serving heroically um, to serve our essential workers and putting themselves in harm's way. So, I mean, I think we need to recognize them for what they're doing and support them for what they're doing, because, you know, again, as we prioritize families, as Abby has said, you know, there are families that are going to have to have child care and custodial care in order to work. So how do we work together to create that access for them? Um, as far as next steps, also before I turn it over to Barbara, we're looking very closely at locations for child care. So organizations like YMCA are in a great position to, to really anchor us. Um, and then also to look at our, our ecosystem of child care because we have um, 
as I said, many child care centers, family day homes, uh, informal networks of care that families are going to turn to. So how are we resourcing all of those networks with what, with what they need to serve families? Um, we're also um, doing a couple more follow-up surveys. So there's a family survey that's about to launch to, so we can get a better handle on both supply and demand. So what is the supply look like currently in our community? Um, and what does the, what does the demand look like? Um, so that is pretty much what I wanted to report, Mayor Stoney, and I'm ready to hand it over to Barbara so she can give you an update um, along with Abby on the out-of-school time partnership. Sure, please do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for having us here tonight. Um, you know, on the, that previous slide, you saw the long list of organizations that are, are working together. And one of the things that I'd say that has uh, been very important during this time is this coming together of the early childhood and the youth development communities. Um, this brings together both those full service for-profit child cares, nonprofit youth organizations, as well as those content providers that do amazing programs of enrichments for kids. We've all been working together to try to figure out how do we create and patch together this quilt of services for Richmond City families. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we're gonna share with you just a, uh, a couple of examples of um, what we're doing as a community and, and give you three examples, what next up my organization is doing with content providers. And then also we'll talk about Parks and Rec and Chris Fel Felke, our director of Parks and Rec is out of town this week. So I'm gonna try to do his, uh, his uh, intro justice, but he's just been an amazing partner through all of this. And then Abby will um, just highlight again what the YMCA has been doing and, and working on this fall. But I just want to say, as, as Rich said, this is just three examples. And we have organizations like Peter Paul Development Center, Higher Achievement, Boys and Girls Club, um, and many more who are working every day directly with families, either virtually, door to door, um, and trying to figure out Salvation Army, trying to figure out how they can support kids with school learning this year and create that kind of pod um, um, experience for, for kids. So just to give you some um, highlights here, my organization uh, that I have the, the honor and, and, and pleasure of running is Next Up RVA. We coordinate out of school time learning enrichments for Richmond City Middle Schools is what our focus has been. And we work with about 50 community organizations. Sometimes they're um, RPS teachers who apply to do after school learning enrichments as well. But most of our organizations in our network are nonprofits. We do work with some small businesses as well, providing arts and STEM classes, sports and wellness, workforce and leadership programs. We quickly pivoted to an online experience for the kids uh, when the schools closed and were able to um, bring training to the provider community on how they too could deliver their classes in a distance learning um, environment. We created a social media, social connection aspect with that too. We've heard from kids that this has been one of their lifelines to staying connected with each other with caring adults that they've come to depend on and rely on, and also to make friends across schools. That was one of the really interesting value adds that we experienced is that they got to actually be in these virtual classes with kids from other middle schools across the city that uh, they just said that was one of the highlights as well. As we're looking at the fall, um, we are gonna continue with the online portal uh, we are looking at also adding um, our providers. They, many of them serve high schoolers and elementary kids. So we're also looking at adding their programs for high school and elementary, recognizing that kids need the social emotional, the learning enrichment to discover their talents and, and their skills and to put those skills to work. Many of our providers are actually now delivering materials home and we provide the funding to our, to our provider network to do their programs thanks to in large part funding from the city. All of this is at no cost to RPS families. Um, so what we're looking at is continuing that and expanding that. Over the summer, we've connected over 300 RPS students with content providers among our network through this online portal. So we expect that over the school year we would be doubling, if not tripling that. So 
we'll continue that. Um, we've also been able to help our providers with creating more on-demand uh, programs. So if kids need to be able to go back and watch a class, they missed it, they can do that as well. And then we've been um, finding out from our program providers who is interested or already planning on doing on-site in-person classes. I'll tell you the truth is, is that few are. Um, there are limited options for kids and families right now to be able to have a place to go um, and to be able to do on um, face to face classes. We surveyed our, our network and about three providers told us that they would, are interested in doing face to face facilitated learning pods um, this fall. And I was, I was honestly, I was surprised by that, that it was so small. The ratio factor that um, uh, Rich talked about is a hard one. You're talking about a business model that you know you can get by if you can have a capacity of 100 kids and because of COVID and health to keep everybody safe, you can have you know half of that and you have fixed costs and a lot of organizations and businesses are telling us they just can't make it. So the online is a way that they can, but you know our kids need to need to see each other. We all do. And so we just have to weather the storm a little bit. You can go to the next slide. Um, on the side of where there is congregate care or you know face-to-face, -face, um, the next slide will share with you a little bit about what Parks and Rec is, has been doing this summer. And if we can see the next slide, please. Thanks. So Parks and Rec created pop-ups, which is actually something they've always done. Um, but during COVID in the summertime, it really found a new, a new a life and a new need. Uh, Monday through Friday from eight to one, it's free to kids. They can show up. Most programming is outside, so they're able to maintain good social distancing. It's been a, an opportunity for kids to have activities to do, to have breakfast and lunch through the summer program has been really critical. And then also they've been able to get camp in a box is what they call it, but it's actually take home uh, materials to do with, at home by themselves or with their siblings or with their family. So for this fall, Parks and Rec is planning to continue to do the pop-ups for as long as the weather will allow. They have lots of pavilion space that can, can give kids shelter. And so they're looking at moving that instead of during the school day from eight to one, moving that to three to 8 p.m. And so again, snack and dinner, which will be so key. We were providing dinner with RPS in the middle schools. And I'll tell you, there's so many kids who depend on that. Um, so I'm glad to see Parks and Rec is gonna be able to continue that along with um, RPS. And so they'll continue to do some of their programming there. And what we're doing with Next Step is we're letting all these organizations like Parks and Rec, the YMCA, all of the large um, youth organizations and child care centers also know that they can log into the online portal and have kids actually also do the learning enrichments in the afternoons as well through us at no cost, you know, as long as they're RPS families. So we're looking forward to that and all working together to figure out how we create this quilt, you know, this quilt of support for the kids and their families during this fall. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Abby, who can talk briefly a little bit more about the YMCA. Yeah, so we hit um, most of the information uh, as going through it earlier, but just you can see here a little bit of the schedule that on the in-person programming that we would be doing with whatever school system we were working with, uh, we would be open from seven to six, which is your normal before school, uh, all the way through your after school choices for families that would need that kind of space, um, going on a week by week basis uh, for that learning, but having the opportunity to have somebody help just facilitate the technology issues and uh, the wiggles with younger kids on the virtual learning. Uh, to keep them engaged, to keep them refocusing where they're going to go for those families that don't have a parent that can stay home and do that. Uh, Barbara mentioned the feeding that is so important that this, these programs will give us an opportunity for the children that are with us all day to have that um, feeding opportunity for them uh, because it is so important for those that are food insecure to have that kind of convenient space for the family to ensure that they are eating. Uh, but then also in the enrichment activities, we've worked very closely with RPS for a number of years on the Power Scholars programming where we have a morning of, it has been in person this year, we did virtual with them, uh, classroom education work, but then in the afternoon enrichment classes, which allows us to be able to just supplement that work with other things that is continuing that learning, but 
feeling a little more like a camp type experience. Um, so they're having fun, they're getting up, they're doing physical activities, doing those enrichment opportunities, and then really giving them a chance to have some homework help, some choices in their activities, and keeping them in a safe environment until parents are ready to pick them up after the day. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so this is just a little bit, I, I hit some of these things uh, of what we've learned having done this for the last five months now. For programs, we haven't had any issues in our programs with COVID. Uh, the Y across the country has done emergency child care for over 40,000 students and has had great success um, in all of those programs all across the countries and all kinds of communities. Um, we worked very closely with the health department and CDC to understand what their guidelines are, to continue to stay updated as they've made changes and learned more. Uh, so we have very rigorous checking the students before they enter. We're not mixing other people inside the buildings where the kids are. So parents aren't even coming into where the program is. We're cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. We're being very diligent, training for our staff, intentionality around that. Um, but as I mentioned, why that congregate care is so hard to do well and right, but also why the school buildings um, can be the, the best spaces. There are other buildings that can do it, but really are built to do it is because we want to keep these groups and pods 10 to 13 kids uh, where they can be socially distanced in a smaller group, but that 10 or 13 kids are not interacting with any other kids. They're in their own space, they're in their own place, and they're really even in crossing in hallways or where they're eating lunch, not really have any interaction outside that pod, which keeps any issues very isolated to that group and allows us to be able to um, really know where and how transmissions might have happened if and when they do happen. Because it is not 100% safe that we have had very good luck um, and we just <laughs> give credit to where it's due on that as we go forward. So, um, and the activities are different. We are unteaching many things that we've been teaching our kids, you know, independent learning. We're not doing group learning like uh, many of our programs have been pushed. We're not sharing. Uh, there is no sharing. Have your own set of stuff. And those are all different lessons. Um, but we've had to be creative and being creative and understanding what those programs can look like and what we can and can't do in order to keep them safe, to keep them socially distanced, but also engaged and happy to be there and having a great time. So those are some of the things that we have um, just really gotten deep into understanding as we've done this um, since March. You go to the next one. And so I just, before I pass it back, I think Elliot's gonna close this out quickly, but I will say that this has really been an amazing opportunity to work so closely with so many nonprofits, whether it's Parks and Rec, uh, Next Up, all of the other providers that have really come together to work in a very unique way. Uh, you know, Parks and Rec and the Y have been very close in this emergency childcare. They took on some of it in schools. When schools closed in the beginning, we had the, um, uh, the opportunity to use our facilities in the spring because our facilities were closed. And so just in the sharing of lessons back and forth and understanding where we fit and how we do, it has been a really amazing time to see the nonprofit community and the child care provider community in Richmond come together to serve our kids and families. So Elliot, I'll turn it over to you with that. Great. Thanks, Abby. So, and, and thank you all. Uh, so yeah, my name is Elliot Haspel. For those of you who don't know me, so I'm a program officer for education policy and research at the Robbins Foundation. But in this particular capacity, um, I was asked to help pitch in while Eva Colon is still um, finishing up her maternity leave. Um, Mary Stoney is a uh, you know, senior advisor for youth initiatives. So I just want to provide a little bit of big picture, um, sort of uh, the aerial view a little bit. So one of the things we obviously don't have at the moment is a really clear sense of what parents uh, sort of want or need. We know many parents are going to need some kind of care and facilitated learning. Um, we don't have really tight data at the moment about exactly how many of those parents are, how, how many parents prefer to do it in sort of a co-op pod versus, you know, working in a congregate setting, things like that. And we are working to get that data. Many community partners are reaching out to the parents they work with. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's a group of us through the task force that's designing the parent survey that Rich met mentioned that will be going out shortly. So we, we know that that data is necessary, but we do have is we can look at other districts, uh, both in, around the, the state and around the nation that have been preparing for this. And the vast majority of the significantly sized school districts that I've looked at do have some kind of what you call it a public provision of um, you know, a pandemic care and facilitated learning. And so this is everything from Chesterfield and Henrico, districts in the Baltimore area, um, San Francisco. Uh, and San Francisco, we actually have some numbers from. So the San Francisco Unified School District is about double the size of RPS in enrollment. They have set up their sort of learning hub model to take in approximately 6,000 kids a day. So, you know, if you think about it, you know, half that, maybe as many as 3,000 kids in RPS would need some kind of care. 
uh, now we can, the, as has been mentioned, you know, this idea of, you know, using libraries and rec centers can certainly be an option. Um, one thing for our particular libraries and rec centers, um, you know, within the Richmond area, as uh, Chris Relke has mentioned, is they're not necessarily set up to take in more than one or two pods because largely they're open rooms. And because of what we, you know, sort of know from the, the public health standpoint, like you'd prefer children to be in separate enclosed rooms just from an airflow perspective, all the rest of that. So if you think about like a branch library, um, you know, where it's basically one big room, right? You can maybe have one pod in that, that entire, you know, branch library. So that limits you and how many kids you can can take in. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that sort of the trade-off here is that you, we're going to, I and mean, look, there's going to be a quilt, as Barbara said, out of, you know, churches and synagogues and libraries and rec centers and, uh, you know, uh, sort of other, other provisions. Uh, but the idea of being able to have a few anchor sites uh, is, seems to be best practice. It gets you a few things. One is it lets you make sure you're communicating clearly to parents so that there are a few sites available to them. Uh, with, so you're not having families that are falling through the cracks. Number two is it lets you ensure you're providing sort of high quality equity-based supportive programming for the highest need students. You know, think about, you know, you know where those students are, you have a little bit more sort of control over the program. So you, know, you can connect maybe while a student's there, you know, getting supportive virtual learning and during their, during a break, they're also getting a, you know, mental health, uh, you know, a therapy session with, with a therapist from Child Savers, right? You're able to do that better if, if you know where they are and if some of them are centralized. Um, so there's a trade-off to not using uh, sort of sites like uh, school sites, for example. Um, but I know it can seem odd, right? Like, why did we close the schools and then we're going to open them again to use them for sort of pandemic care and facilitated learning? And I just wanted to mention that the research does suggest there is a qualitative difference in running a full-on educational program within a school and spreading out, you know, uh, 75, 100 kids in a school that's designed for 800 kids um, and have a skeleton administrative staff, like Abby was mentioning, you know, you can, can really keep the kids much more separate in, in that. And that's, again, what we're seeing many districts around um, the state and then the nation are really sort of adopting that kind of a model. So um, I just want to sort of, uh, big picture, I think we're going to have to be creative in this because there's no one solution and, and we have to be driven by parent voice. That's been, you know, I think needs to be a central principle that we don't sort of want to uh, design a solution that is uh, not aligned with, with parental preference and needs, particularly centering equity in that. Um, but I think it's safe to say, looking at other places that some kind of anchor uh, sort of institution that is at least providing a few, um, at least at a few sites around the city does seem to be best practice. So um, just want to mention that. And then, you know, I think any of us who've spoken through this section would be happy to, to take any questions. Mr. Mayor, you're on mute. I, I just said a full, a mouthful as well. You all missed all that, but I, all of it was thank you, actually. Thank you to Elliot, uh, Abby, Barbara, Rich for the presentation from um, the Child Care Task Force, and thank you for your work as well in the earlier part of the year uh, as we begin the, um, as the, the pandemic emerged, the virus emerged here in the city of Richmond. What I've gathered and gleaned from your uh, discussion is um, the questions, just a couple questions that I wrote down is, first, uh, should the city uh, uh, play a role alongside uh, our partners at RPS in ensuring that families have, uh, have childcare uh, in case they have to work and there's no other option for those families? Uh, and then uh, number two is, should we uh, put the use of uh, schools, which is not in my domain, but in the domain of Richmond Public Schools, uh, to use to ensure that happens. Uh, I'm a believer that we should um, we should work together to provide this sort of uh, the safety net for our families who need it the most, who are going to be uh, uh, pushed to the front lines to ensure that they are uh, making a, a, a salary, a wage to, to 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 put food on the table and a roof over their their families' heads, um, but uh, working on the facility piece is something that we would have to work um, in a collaboration with RPS. Um, and so uh, the, I think those are the questions 
that are before us. And I guess the third question is, if not RPS, then what are our options uh, for these sort of facilities to ensure that this safety net is provided for um, our kids? And so with that, I'll open it up to the, uh, to the compact. Mr. Young? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I think that was really well said. Uh, so thank you for it. And, uh, and I would perhaps add a, a, a fifth inquiry and specifically what, uh, what role or opportunity is there? And this was, this was discussed, I'm not gonna belabor the point, but what opportunity is there to facilitate pods across, across the city, particularly in under-resourced uh, neighborhoods uh, as it relates to our, stu our students to ensure that we have, uh, can uh, provide for some accountability partners as, as students uh, go, go virtual. We, we are all recognize that um, uh, it uh, will be more than and ever uh, difficult uh, for some of our young people. And, and uh, though some pods are beginning to develop in some parts of the city, uh, I, I personally think there is a, a role uh, for, uh, for RPS and for the city and for our partners to help facilitate uh, matchmaking um, in near proximity to persons' residences in a safe, safe way to provide for some accountability partners um, to uh, uh, encourage folks to get online to be, and plug in to begin with. And so, uh, so I, I would add that to the list, but uh, thank you for listening, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Uh, Jones. I, yes, yes, indeed. I, I appreciate what uh, uh, Member Young just shared. I, I believe th this is this is an all hands on deck because regardless of if I'm on council and schools aren't my, they're not my thing, but it is. We all have got to be on board to try and find community solutions. I talked about it in, uh, uh, on Sunday, even in my church that if it is creating that pod, if it is going to your neighbors and, you know, making some pact or agreement that, hey, we're going to work together and, uh, um, you know, find a way to assist one another and even challenge, uh, uh, you know, local churches to find a way to be a resource. It may not be every household that needs assistance, but, um, you know, I know, I know the need is going to be there in the ninth district because I went out uh, and helped uh, help feed when this thing first hit, and the number of families that uh, that were in need was overwhelming. It really was, and so I know that as this persists, that the need for resources, the need for food, the need for so many different things. And Mr. Mayor, you were out with us on uh, on uh, Saturday at John Marshall. Um, they fed from 12 o'clock noon until on the, they gave out food from 12 noon until 8 22 at night and i saw people from my district there all the way on north side and so there's such a great need and so as we share uh, uh, uh plans as we share thoughts the more information the more resources we can get out there so we can help individuals that have space uh, uh, convert that space or try to flip that space to uh, meet the needs of the community, the more we can do that, the better. And so uh, I'll, I know that my ninth district office, we're going to be focusing on that in the next few weeks here to see how we can, uh, how we can help, uh, how we can assist. And uh, uh, member Owen, if, if you have any ideas on how we can make this happen, um, please get with me because I'm going to be reaching out to churches in district over the next few days here just to see who's able, willing, uh, as we do this all hands on deck type situation to help our families. Mr. Meyer? Yes, Ms. Larson. Okay. Um, if I could just weigh in for a minute. Um, we spoke to a lot of these folks at the education and human services meeting last week. Um, we've talked to Chris Frelke several times and I appreciate everybody's hard work. Um, I think the space thing is a real issue, concern, and um, preparing with the schools on this just makes sense. The space is already set up for children. Um, the amount of money that we would have to spend to convert 
other spaces to the needs of these um, providers would be, it would be very costly. So I think we really need to examine this option and I would appreciate the school's partnership on this, um, this need in our community. Mr. Mayor, if I could, when I talk about converting spaces, my church already has Sunday school. We already have uh, everything set up for school, hence Sunday school. And so when I, when I said, when I mentioned converting, that's kind of what I meant as far as just, you know, in purpose and plan and mission, how can some of our spaces that are already set up uh, to handle large numbers of people be situated in such a way that that we can assist uh, RPS schools and I, I, a pathway of least resistance is schools. I get that. I understand that piece. Uh, but again, you know, there's going to be a lot of families that may not want to bring all their kids, or schools might reach their point, or or and or. Then we're back to the old issue of should we have schools, open schools, or not? So, you know, again, I still want us to partner, find a way to partner with local organizations, local community centers, local, local churches um, to assist in this manner. I, I've got a strip mall that has a huge movie theater. <laughs> and so uh, we have an opportunity to house kids. We've done it before. And so I just want to see how we can make this happen. And, and, and Dr. Jones, you were offering the alternative if RPS schools are unavailable for uh, such an option, correct? Exactly. Yep. Yep. Mr. Mayor, can I jump in? This is Abby. Sure. I would say we're going to need all of those options, um, right? Like, I mean, we're going to need the churches to come out and support these kids in whatever manner they can, you know, and even more, even if we get the schools, even if there was an opportunity to use any of the schools, all of these options, because, you know, so in Henrico County, we're going to do five schools. We'll have 100 to 120 students in each school. It, it's still only 700 students. Uh, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what we can do, but that is 700 that we don't have to find in 10 pockets of 10 and 20, but we're going to need all of those options on the table to be able to serve families. It, we believe, but we don't know what the demand is going to be. Um, but we do know that we're getting a lot of requests and a lot of information from families who do need help. So I just would put that on the table that I don't think this is an either or necessarily it becomes much greater um, if the schools aren't an option, and I understand, as I said before, all of the considerations that come into that. Um, but even if that were to be, we're going to need every church and every opportunity to try to do that congregate care as well. And, and let me uh, just clarify real quick. I mean, there are 44 plus school facilities that are, you know, in the school's uh, facility stock. Um, there's, there's no need to to, to open the doors for 44 schools, correct? I mean, I, I think that would be unnecessary, but obviously um, the concern of the school board, I believe has been, you know, not every school, and that's something that we are working on together collectively, city council, school board, this office as well, to make sure that we provide sort of up-to-date um, air filtration, uh, HVAC units in all of our schools, and we are not there yet. And I think we all have to be honest with ourselves with that. Um, However, I, I think we can all agree there are some schools that at least have been built in the last decade that might be there, but not everyone is. And uh, whether it's Ms. Burke or Ms. Owen or, uh, or Ms. Doerr, they all know that there are some schools in their district that just are not suited yet to, to reopen because of that, um, um, uh, that flaw, I guess you could say, in, in where our schools are to date. Uh, but there are some schools that are at least, I think, uh, are state-of-the-art in the city of Richmond. I think three of the new schools that will be opening in September are a great example of such. Mr. Mayor, um, if I may? Yeah, yes, Ms. Burke. All right, thank you. Um, what my concern is, in the East End, we have eight schools. Mm -hmm. And again, I'll go back. We have bus transportation for our students. All right. Whether we use schools or don't use schools, transportation will be an issue. Whereas I'm thinking right now, for instance, a um, church in Fulton, Mount Calvary, has served as a facilitator when we um, issue food and other items. So they're already, and our parents are safe because it's in walking distance. We don't have community schools. 
So if we were in the East End, there are only, what, two or three schools that are new or newer that would be up to par, per se. So I'm, I'm, I look forward to the board discussing this during our Monday night's meeting because, um, and of course, we don't want to leave anybody's child behind. But my concern is that I want to make sure that those students that don't have transportation, that do have the challenges, that they are served as well. And my biggest fear is that if we're going to open in the East End, let's say ML King or the new uh, Henry, Henry L. Marsh, how are they, how are they going to get there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, how are they going to mm -hmm. get there? So I just want us to be mindful of, I, I, I look forward to, um, and as I talk to many of my parents here, I've been working at length with Peter Paul Development Center as well in, in discussion and a couple of other um, places that a lot of families right now, during, when they had the camp during the summer, the Richmond Public Schools virtual camp, they would all go around the corner to a house in their neighborhood mm -hmm. and they all will have their Chromebooks and work together, okay? And there's so many other little settings. I know there's smaller pods, but I just want to be fair that every child has the opportunity, not just the haves, but the have nots as well, yes, to, to be in, in, in walking distance or have that transportation in place. And we don't have the transportation. So that's just something to think about. I, I think every program that, that has been explained has been great, um, especially next up. I'm familiar with some children that participated in that virtual class classes this summer and thank you so very much Barbara that was that was I received just raving reviews regarding that but I want us to be and I'm, I'm when, you, when I think about the task force um, and the report that was just given I, I want to survey my own area as well okay I'm gonna say it like that I appreciate what was done because I'm talking to too many people with daycares and smaller settings who are already set up in classroom settings, as Dr. Jones just stated. Churches as well that have their other organizations also. So um, I don't, I don't want to tune out and just have one setting or one school setting per area and the children that need to be there aren't. And we're, we're providing breakfast and lunch, so that's not an issue. I'm sorry, Linda, go ahead. I just want to get that in. That, that, no, Ms. Burke, that was great. I, I think, so you, know, you add to the questions that me and uh, Mr. Young added is, you know, the one, the one is the transportation question, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, that's a great component of our after school programming is the transportation component that we got all obviously got to check that box if we're going to do child care as well. So uh, let's go to uh, first, um, it, did Ms. Owen? Want to say yeah. something, and then we'll do the Miss Sipe may have something to say as well. I, uh, just very briefly, I I cannot speak for the board. I think we really everybody seems to be saying we need Richmond Public Schools to do this. Well, who's going to make that decision? Is not me. It's not Mr. Young. It's not Miss Burke. It's all of us having a robust discussion and considering all the things that are playing into this. There are a lot of them not just transportation, but, you know, we've, we've spent all this money, you know, deep cleaning our schools. Um, we, there, there's just a lot. So please give the board the opportunity to discuss this and all of the ramifications. Thank you. Also, Mr. Mayor, Dr. Newbell just sent a note that she is encouraged to continue this conversation regarding meeting the needs of our children throughout the city because we know they're spreading out. So she too would like to continue that conversation. Mr. Thanks. Mayor, once um, Barbara's done, could I hop in for a second? Sure. Uh, Barbara, you want to go ahead and then, um, I don't know who that was. It was Elliot. Oh, okay, Elliot. Sounds good. Um, Barbara first. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add here, you know, I think the, the model that we're quilting together here involves community organizations being able to do what they can within their neighborhoods and communities the private sector with child care providers, as well as having just a few anchor um, buildings like schools or, you know, we floated around the idea of the convention center. Um, Councilman Jones, you, the large churches that have the Sunday schools, it's a great suggestion. It's going to take all those pieces. 
Um, and I think the other thing in here that we have to be mindful of too is that for the business side of, for these providers, we could put all this together, but if these organizations and these businesses can't afford to pay their staff and take care of their fixed costs for this, they are gonna go out of business. And we won't have places for kids to go and we won't have businesses ready to take kids when everyone can go back to work too. Um, and that, that's keeping me up at night, thinking about that, thinking about all of these organizations and, and staff who can't pass this cost on to the parents. You just can't pass it on. It's, you're talking about doubling the rates and our parents can't afford that. So I think we also need to be thinking about what are some incentives, what are the levers that we have to pull, whether it's reimbursement rates, whether it's CARES Act funding, things that we can help parents with, just as we're helping them with, with rent and mortgage. Well, how can we help them also for, afford out of school time, out of home care, whether that's through family, friend, and neighbors and folks coming together like Ms. Burke was referring to. We are gonna see a lot of that. And the family, friend, neighbor um, is a sector. That is a way that communities forever have cared for children. And it's an important piece of the fabric. And we're gonna see those kinds of things that are very basic. We're gonna see those things be really important right now and how do we support them with that and organizations like child savers have been doing that for a very long time so i say let's find out what are they going to need to support families right in the neighborhood as we look at all of these solutions so i just add that to the table um you know I, it's it's not an easy answer but none of this is but i thank you guys for for listening and, and putting this one into the solution pot as well Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Elliot. Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, in some ways echo what Barbara just said, this is definitely a, a both and, 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 and discussion. Um, you know, no one thinks the opening one school on the east end, one school on the south side, one school on the north side for the wider on a program, for example, or another, you know, and then we're like, all right, we're good. Um, and just to give you a little more detail on what something, so I'm, one of the things I'm trying to do is help compile a sense of just like, who, what are all of the assets we have to deploy? So I'm in conversation with, for example, for Richmond, which is doing some work sort of basically inventorying the faith community, like Dr. D. Jones said about the, you know, different churches and synagogues, mosques, as they're, they're able to offer this um, through Rich. And the, you know, the Smart Beginnings and Child Savers, we sent out a survey to all of the licensed child care providers in the, in the area, basically, again, asking, like, how many of them are prepared to take in school-aged children, because Barbara's right, often it's that family child care down the, you know, down the street, to your point, Ms. Berger, who is, that you can walk to, that, that's, you know, able to, to take in, so you know, and so on and so forth. And that's even catching the, um, you know, sort of the, I almost call them like the one-offs that you wouldn't expect. Like, uh, you know, there was that article in the RTD the other week about how Celebrate Richmond is, you know, converting their space to be able to take in um, some children. So like, we're going to need to basically, this is one thing, just so you know, like we are trying to compile. I'm also working with the Community Wealth Building Office. Um, just really trying to get that sense of, you know, both what are our assets, and then again, you're, where are the needs? So, and, and working again with community partners there, Peter, Paul, Sacred Heart Center for you know the Latino community, because really we can we we have to center parent voice on this. So just to just to say yes, like the schools will be one piece of a of a larger. No one thinks that's the only solution that's needed. And I will say to Elliot, to your point, you know, at the Y, because we've now got five months of um, experience in running this and kind of understanding what the regulations are and what are the things that work and don't work, and just trying to like hand our standard operating procedures to whoever, whoever wants them and needs them, right? Like I've been working with a group in Northside from the four Richmond group who has been trying to set up a hundred pods where they can do, right? So all of this is coming together and we're all working together to try to share the best information to help facilitate the opening of whatever we can because we do know it's going to take all of us to be able to do this work for our kids and families and to ensure that we're creating that equity across our entire city not in certain parts of it as we go forward. Uh, and so just absolutely, we hear you and, and celebrate the idea that we need to ensure that there is opportunities for all of our students. Here, Shoney, just one thing before we close. Yes, I'm Rich. Yep. Out time, but just one thing I would encourage us to do as we're thinking about a path forward is also include our, our local businesses in the equation who are operating childcare businesses and family day homes and informal networks of care. Um, talk to them if you haven't to learn more about their struggles. Because uh, I promise you, you'll hear some very 
heartwarming and heroic stories of, of our citizens in Richmond who are, who are doing this work and to Abby, Abby's point, never closed um, and continuing to serve our families. So I, I, again, I think if we're using a family-centered approach and we're thinking about these childcare providers, I think we'll, we'll come up with solutions. You know, what I've heard, this is just, you know, me anal my analysis of the situation is what I heard uh, is a consensus from um, city council and the school board on the need that we need to find a, find some solutions and that everything should be on the table, um, including the way we get uh, our children from home to the sites and back. Uh, but also I hear from the school board that we need to also, um, they need to have this conversation amongst themselves as a board as well to discuss how they play a role in these solutions moving forward as well. And, and if I'm wrong about that, uh, Chairwoman Owen, uh, please correct me. You're on mute, Linda. Linda, Linda. <laughs> Still on mute. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's right. That's that's what I've been saying. We yep. we the board, not just me, the board has to make these this decision and have this discussion. Well, I think we can count this up as as great engagement on the issue uh, from a lot of good stakeholders who want the best for all of our children in this most critical time uh, in their development. And also they're gonna remember this right here, this pandemic for a very, very long time. And so uh, it's my hope that we provide it as a compact, as a team collaborating together, uh, the sort of options that are available to us as a city, uh, as, a, as a system as well. And I know you all have a meeting on Monday and it's my hope that we can uh, come to agreement on some solutions that I think will be worthwhile for our families as they enter the 2020-2021 uh, school year. Can we all agree to that? Yes. Mr. Mayor? Yes. For fear of, <laughs> for fear of getting in trouble here, um, might I suggest, could we have, just because we have so much on our plate in a very, very little time, uh, very short time to do it, may I suggest that um, I personally love these education compact meetings. Um, if, if I'm glad you do. Together, I do. I'm a fan. Um, I'm a believer. You made a believer out of me. Um, in any case, if we could come together perhaps in the next week and a half or two weeks and reconvene and talk about um, both space, transportation, and budget um, so that we can support the good work of the school board and of our, of our providers um, that are working to solve this issue, um, that might be a... a um, yeah, that, that's, that's a great councilwoman. And I think what I'll have my team do, all those who are on right now, we have to go back to um, at least huddle on uh, what we can offer in terms of funding, um, um, obviously on the transportation front as well, and what might be available from other uh, outlets as well. Um, obviously, we're not the only ones involved in something like this, but I think we all can agree that uh, we know that this could be problematic for a lot of families who are, are facing the, the question of what are we gonna do come you know, September? So um, I'm glad that we had this conversation. I think it's necessary and I think um, uh, our constituents are looking for us to at least provide some sol solutions and some options that are available to them, that, which, mean, that, which may be a range, right? And we talked about that range this evening. Is there any other further comments? President Newbill has chimed in and is, and she raised us, she raised the bar and wants to schedule within the next week. And she also conveys her deep, deep appreciation to Superintendent Cameras um, and the school board and you, Mr. Mayor, for a job well done um, and all of the providers and partners on the phone um, for, uh, for their efforts in, in getting, uh, getting this strategy and this plan together in such a short amount of time. Yes, I, I, I did create a very um, <laughs> a short timeline for those Lofty. on the task force. Uh, <laughs> I think when I, when I said it, I think a lot of them, it was just all done virtually, but I think I may have heard a, a couple of uh, gas, but they were up to the, uh, the challenge because this is what they do. This is, uh, uh, this is their wheelhouse. And so um, 
they've come up with some, some I think, some good solutions. And I've heard from, whether it's Councilman Jones or from uh, Member Burke as well, there are some other, some, some other questions we have to answer collectively uh, in uh, each of our, um, in, in, in the different lanes that are out there, city council, school board, and the, uh, the mayor's office and the executive branch. And so let's get to answering some of those questions so we can uh, ensure that we create that safety net for our kids. Can we all agree to that? Yes. All right, is there anything else for the good of the order? Seeing none, at 8.03, we have adjourned. Thank you, everyone.